Lord Jesus, we gather to praise you. You are worthy of all glory and honor. We are overwhelmed, Lord, that you, as the king of the universe, would meet with us here. Lord, your promise that where two or three are gathered here in their presence, Lord, is uh, in our minds. We thank you, Lord, for that so that we know you are present. And we invite you, Lord, to continue to speak to us and through us to the world. Lord, we know that, that you have told us to pray for things on earth to be like they are in heaven. So right now, Lord, I, I pray that you would be bringing provision to people who are in financial need right now. In heaven, there is no need. So we pray here on earth, especially for the people here in this room, or that you would meet financial needs. We know in heaven there is no conflict, there's no misunderstandings. We pray for that in the families and the friendships right here on earth and for those represented in this room. We pray, Lord, that you would be bringing uh, re reconciliation where it's needed and, and deeper understanding where it's needed. Lord, you know every need in this room right now. And so, uh, Lord, we look to you as our Heavenly Father. And in this moment of silence, we speak to you about that which concerns us most. Thank you for hearing us, Lord, and for your promise to be responding. And we pray, Lord, that when you do answer these prayers, Lord, that you would remind us of this moment so we can return thanks to you and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome to Crossroads. My name's Steve Cordell. I'm lead pastor here. We're glad you're worshiping with us. And uh, I also want to say thank you to all who prayed for our awakening service uh, this Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday night. As you've heard, it was certainly uh, a, a powerful experience of God's love and presence, and it doesn't happen without the prayers of his people. So thank you for all who, who prayed. Now, uh, if you've got your Bible, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to take a look at some of the words of Jesus there. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can just raise your hand. Ushers will come down the aisle. They'll be glad to pass you one so you can follow along with us out of this text today. I'm going to read that for us. Matthew 9, 35 to 38 say this. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Well, I don't think I'm alone in enjoying superhero movies. Uh, it's always fun to see the good guys win. You know, Superman swoops in, saves the day. Spider-Man saves whoever is in distress. It's always good to see that. It doesn't always work out that way in real life. But last year in Paris, it did. There was a guy that was dubbed Le Spider-Man because he saw a child who was dangling off of a balcony four floors up. And while a crowd watched, he took action. He scaled the building, and this is what happened. Ils ont pas fait quelque chose de mal devant moi parce que ça me fait mal de cœur. Je suis couru pour régaler les solutions un peu pour que je puisse le sauver. Et Dieu merci, je suis monté sur le balcon au cinquième étage, j'ai le sauvé. Isn't that amazing? Wow, to climb like that and to save that child. Uh, he was motivated. Why? Why did he do that? He, if, if you saw what he said there in the subtitle. He, he said he, he likes children, he cared about them, he didn't want to see that child be hurt. He had compassion on him. Now, 
He's an immigrant from Mali, and because of that, uh, he was without a citizenship. But when that happened, he was invited to meet the president of France. He was granted citizenship, and he was offered a job with the Paris Fire Department, as a matter of fact. Uh, it was pretty inspiring to see. Everybody else was kind of watching, but he took action. He thought, I could do this, and he did because of his compassion. I think many of us who are followers of Jesus view evangelism like that. We see people who are apart from Christ, you might say, dangling from a balcony in a spiritual sense. That is, they're not far from entering a Christless eternity. And we know what the New Testament says. We know what Jesus says about people who are apart from him, that they don't have life. And when this life is over, they'll really lost. But we think, what can I do? We're kind of like, the crowd there watching the child dangle like, boy, we don't want that child to be hurt, but what can I do? Boy, I don't want these people who are around me, you know, in my community and people I know to be apart from Christ, but what can I do? Every once in a while, there's a heroic individual that steps up and does something, you know, shares their faith, and takes their, dares to communicate about Jesus with somebody who's far from him. And we can admire that person, but then we're not really sure we could do the same thing. Like, I was admiring a, a, a guy that I heard about who went to go see the magician Penn Teller. You know, the, he's of the Penn and Teller duo of fame. And the uh, Penn and Teller, after their shows, will meet people. And this one guy who had gone to the show to see Penn got in line and presented Penn with a Bible and told uh, Penn about the love of God, which is an amazing thing is because Penn is not a follower of Christ. And when he did that, I was impressed because I thought, wow, I'm a pastor. It's never occurred to me to go track down the star of a show that I've seen and tell him about Jesus. But this guy did that. And what was amazing to me was Penn's response, his reaction to that guy. And this is what he said about that. I believe he knew that I was an atheist. But he was not uh, defensive, and he looked me right in the eyes. And he was truly complimentary. It wasn't in any way, it didn't seem like empty flattery. He was really kind and nice and sane and looked me in the eyes and talked to me and then gave me this Bible. And I've always said, you know, that I, I don't respect people who don't proselytize. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there's a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or whatever, and you think that, uh, well, it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward. And atheists who think that people shouldn't proselytize, just leave me alone, keep your religion to yourself. Uh, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? I mean, if I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, and that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you. And this is more important than that. Penetrating words from an atheist. He may not believe, but he gets it. How much do you have to hate somebody not to tell them about Jesus? He gets it. If you really care about somebody, you want to communicate to them about what's most vital and important to their life and future. Jesus was saying and feeling something similar in Matthew 9. In Matthew 9, Jesus looks at the crowds of people and these people were not close to God. They were not a part, you know, of, of uh, what God was doing in the world. But Jesus didn't look at them as his enemies. Jesus didn't say, why don't you get your act together? Jesus didn't say, boy, you deserve whatever you get. You're far from God. What did he say? When you look at Jesus' reaction... It says that he had compassion on them. He didn't see them as enemies. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. 
Jesus still sees people the same way today. When you're next in a crowd, say at a concert, maybe just in a crowded grocery store, look around. The people you see are either followers or not followers of Jesus. They're either living with life from the Holy Spirit that will never end and always be in his presence, or they're living without any life, that they're spiritually dead, and when this body is done, they'll go to a Christless eternity that's a permanent death. Those are the two camps. And when you're looking at a crowd, what you're going to see is that there are some of those people who are sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus shares his perspective because he wants us as his followers to share his same concern. You know, to feel the compassion for those sheep without a shepherd. So I've got a picture here I want to show you. So what's, uh, what do you see there? It's a pretty cute picture, right? Got a lamb, got a sheep. They can look pretty cute and fluffy. I understand that people who care for, you know, who work with sheep, they say, wow, that looks like a big job is what it looks like. It looks like a lot of work. Why? Well, because sheep are dumb. <laughs> it's because, well, they have some intelligence. I mean, they're not totally brainless. They can learn to recognize the voice and the face of their shepherd. And they can bond with other sheep and become friends with other sheep and even feel sad when they're separated from the herd. But they get into trouble easily and they can't get out of trouble very well by themselves because they have a strong herd instinct. Then they're just going to go with the herd no matter what. Uh, they panic easily, uh, and so they'll run headlong into even greater danger if they get spooked. Uh, sheep don't respond with great intelligence and therefore get in trouble and uh, end up hurting themselves, as a matter of fact. I saw a video this week of two sheep that ended up on a cliff, and the shepherd couldn't reach them. The shepherd was the one that was taking the video, and uh, the shepherd was feeling kind of helpless as he looked at these two sheep, or for, for some reason had wandered from the plush grass to this cliff, and they were just following little tufts of grass that grew up out of the cre crevices of the cliff, but it was a sheer cliff. And the shepherd saw they were in danger and couldn't do anything about it. He just stood at the top saying, don't do it, sheep, don't do it. But... First one saw the bunch of grass growing up in the crevice and started walking a little bit further over. They're not designed to cling to a cliff like that and sure enough started sliding and slid right off the cliff to the valley below to its death. The other sheep, the, the shepherd said, don't do it sheep, don't do it. But they have a strong herd instinct. He just followed right along, did the same thing, slid off the cliff as well. Now, I didn't show that video today because I thought some of us in this room might get pretty upset seeing the video, and not without cause. But it's my hope that we all would feel more concern about the people who are right now sliding off the cliff into a Christless eternity than we would feel for the sheep sliding off the cliff. I would hope that that would bother me more. The people that I see around me who apart from God, I hope that that would bother me more than seeing that video. Jesus said the people that he saw, the crowd apart from him are like sheep without a shepherd. And it said he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless. A sheep without a shepherd. No, sheep without a shepherd get harassed. They get chased. They get attacked because the shepherd's not there to protect them. And they can't protect themselves. They don't have fangs. They don't have claws or anything like that. So they just run and get hunted down. And Jesus sees people that are apart from him as harassed, harassed by depression and anxiety, harassed by work pressures that threaten to grind them into the ground, harassed by relational ruptures in their families and distant cold marriages, uh, harassed by anxieties about finances and about their health. 
Now, Christ followers, we can experience same pressures, but we have a shepherd. We have somebody to turn to. We have a power beyond ourselves. People without Jesus don't. They're sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus has compassion on them. And he also has compassion because they're helpless. Sheep without a shepherd end up getting stuck, sometimes in rock crevices, sometimes under shrubberies and all kinds of places. And frankly, sometimes they get stuck in pretty funny places. <laughs> oh, dear. That's funny. <laughs> Uh, you got to love it. <laughs> that sheep had a shepherd. He was okay. But I tend to think that I must cause Jesus some amusement with some of the places I get stuck. I think he must laugh at sometimes at how I get stuck uh, with my own ingenuity in certain ways. But when we have a shepherd, the shepherd helps us. Sheep without a shepherd, they get stuck and they're helpless. Now, nobody likes to be called helpless. We can feel insulted, and uh, no matter who we are, if we're called helpless, but isn't it true that there are times we just don't have the power to break what's coming against us? That we just don't have the ability to get out of the circumstance we find ourselves in? That's certainly the case spiritually. Being far from God, there's nothing we can do in and of ourselves to get back into connection with God. We are helpless in that way. We need the power of God. We need the shepherd, the good shepherd. And so Jesus looks and sees people far from him as sheep without a shepherd who are harassed and who are helpless, and he has compassion. And that compassion causes him to act. Right after this, it says, he turned to his disciples and said, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Out of compassion, because of his compassion, Jesus sends us. He sent his first disciples, but he sends us as well today. He turned to his first disciples and said, see that crowd out there? They're a lot more like them. Pray that God's going to send even more than you disciples. Send more harvest workers out into the harvest field. And today, when Jesus sees the crowds in our region and has compassion. He sends us. We are his response. We are the mechanism, if you will. We are the way that God is going to reach those who are sheep without a shepherd. That's the plan. He's not waiting for the government to do it. He's not waiting for some Supreme Court decision to make it happen. No, he sends us we are the ones he's going to use to help people find their shepherd. And I hope you hear today this one thing, that yes, we're sent, but we're sent as a team. We're sent not alone, but as a team. In Luke chapter 10, we have another little detail when Jesus says and sends them out. Uh, we see that it happens in the context of him commissioning and sending some of his disciples out and, uh, to, to share good news. It says in Luke 10, 1 to 3, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go. So you'll notice Jesus sends them out, not as individuals, but as teams of two. He had 72 people. He could have sent them to 72 places. That would seem efficient, right? But no, that's not what he does. He teams them up, sends them to 36 places. Half as many places, but much greater effect. When we go with a team, we are more effective than when we try by ourselves. That's the power of teamwork. Even superheroes understand the power of teamwork. In the blockbuster movie Avengers Endgame, it's 
set a record for the, the greatest box office gross worldwide ever. Even superheroes, when they need to save the world, get that they need to work as a team. They, they don't have one superhero save the world. They don't have the two, not even three. They have a whole raft of superheroes come together uh, and uh, work to save the world. And uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen the movie, they save the world, just uh, so you know. Uh, but that's what happens when we work as a team. And, you know, we saw this in real life last year in Thailand when there was a youth soccer team that was trapped in a cave two miles in a mountain. And it looked like they were going to die because that cave is flooded and uh, there's no way for them to get out. But then a team formed to help them. You know how big that team was? 10,000 people worked to get them out of that cave. Over 100 professional divers, 900 police officers, 2,000 people from the Thai military, thousands of other volunteers from the country and from other governments all converged. It took 10,000 people to get them out, but they did. It was a near miraculous kind of recovery. One person couldn't have done that. Two or three, no, but the, this team specializing together did it spiritually one person is not going to reach our region for Christ, right? I mean, we can't do that as an individual, not even as two people. And yet the Lord wants to have more harvest workers in, in, in the world, and we get to be a part of that. We get to work as a team. Now, as a church, we can work together, but also, of course, you know, we'll work with other churches. Uh, the Lord uses his people in, in, a, in a team fashion. But when we work as a team, um, one of the, th the helpful aspects of that is it helps us when we confront the obstacles to evangelism. For example, a lot of people feel intimidated to talk about God to somebody else, feel fearful like, what if I say the wrong thing? They'll think, well, they might think that I'm some kind of crazy religious fanatic, and therefore they kind of get silenced. But when we work as a team, a lot of those concerns get muted because we we draw courage from one another. I know that's true for me. I, I like to pray for people that sometimes that, that I don't even know. And I find that when I go to a restaurant, uh, I'll often want to pray for the server who brings me my food. And I do that more when I'm with some other Christ followers than when I'm by myself. Yeah, I've done it by myself, but when I have some others with me, it's just easier to do. Just recently, I was with another friend of mine who's a passionate Christ follower, and we were at a restaurant eating lunch, and the server brought us our food, and as I do sometimes, I said to the server, we're going to pray for our food. We'd like to pray for you, too. If God could do one miracle in your life, what would it be? And she just stood there, and she didn't say anything, and I thought, have I offended her? Is she upset? I don't know. And then I saw, and her eyes kind of were glistening. She was moved, almost to the point of tears, actually. And she said, thank you so much for asking. No one's ever asked me that. And um, she said, I'm really in a financial bind right now. If uh, you could pray for that, that would be really helpful. And so we did, and she thanked us, not just once, but like three or four times, every time she brought something, she would just say, thank you so much for praying for me. You never know. The harvest is plentiful. Sometimes we forget that. We think people don't want to hear. But people need God, and the harvest is plentiful. Now, sometimes when we reach out, we see a result. Sometimes we really don't. But almost all the time when I've offered to pray some, for somebody, they, they gratefully accept that. There have been a, f a few exceptions which stand out in my mind. A few years ago, I'll never forget this, I was with three other pastors. The four of us were at a, a restaurant locally, and we were eating lunch. The server brings the food, and I said, uh, we're going to pray for our food. How can we pray for you? And the server just turns cold and says to me, I'm not for sale, and walks away. And uh, I'm kind of quizzical. I look at the guys, and they shrug their shoulders, and they don't know what that. So, well, we just pray for our food, and then we start to eat. And a couple minutes later, the server comes back and says, oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. I thought you said, how can I pay for you? You said, how can I pray for you? 
I said, yes, you misunderstood me. <laughs> uh, I was really glad it was with three other guys at that point. That's all I'm saying. If I was by myself, I would have just left at that point, I think. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, right? But most of the time, the harvest is more plentiful than we think. And the truth is, maybe you came to Christ, if you're a follower of Jesus, because of a team effort. I know that's the case for me. And I didn't used to think that. I used to think, well, I came because there was a friend of mine down the street who invited me to a youth fellowship when I was in high school, and that's where I heard the gospel, and that's how I came to Christ. So it's because of Richard. But I thought more about that. Why could he invite me to a youth fellowship? Well, because there was a youth fellowship that was started by a mission team. There was a whole team that started that youth fellowship. And each of the members of that mission team were supported by their own team behind them that was supporting them financially and through prayer. And the reason we could meet was because there was somebody who had a big house, they cared about kids, and, and they said, you can use my place for a youth fellowship. There's a whole team of people making it possible for him to invite me to a youth fellowship and for me to hear that Jesus loved me and that I had a chance to follow him. How about you? Maybe you have been invited by somebody, and you know, this is one of the best ways to team. We can team with others through inviting and help people find the shepherd for their souls. And many of us here have had that experience. Uh, Rachel Swihart's part of our church, and I remember her talking about how she was far, not just from God, but she was disconnected from people for the most part. She, except for her husband, was feeling totally alone. She was hard-hearted to other people, critical. Uh, she was uh, one who find fault easily in other people. Uh, but when finally she came to services at Crossroads, one, one day when she was here, uh, during a prayer, I have to say it was not during a brilliant sermon or something like that. No, it was during the prayer that she sensed God's presence in such a powerful way that she knew that God was reaching out to her and inviting her, and her heart changed right there, and she had immediately a different look, outlook on all the people that were sitting around her, and this is what's happened in her life. My name is Rachel Swihart, and my family has been attending Crossroads for almost six years now. Um, we are part of the Weirton campus, and recently I've taken the position of campus pastor at Weirton. I was raised in a, a home that believed in God. We attended church periodically. After graduating high school, I continued to seek church I continued to, to find answers, but really was left empty-handed. And so I kind of put everything on a hold um, until my son was born. Once he was born, I recognized that I wanted him to know God and to really know God. So we enrolled him in Awanas, uh, the Awana program in Wearin. And he began to memorize Bible verses and to read the Bible. And I just saw a change in him at five years old that was remarkable and I started joining in with him and I realized that I wanted more of of that of just um, connecting with God personally my husband was not interested in church at all but he said well if you're gonna start looking for a new church um, a guy at work has been inviting me to this this crossroads and so we went November 2013 we attended our first crossroads service we both were shocked at how different it was to any other church we'd experienced. We felt very welcomed, we felt very strange, but we went week after week. So that following January, there was a new Following Jesus class that was starting, and I was like, I wanna take this. And really I went to, to kind of, I was waiting for Crossroads to prove to me they weren't, they weren't good enough. But each class I left there, more, more excited, more, more hungry for more. I was like, this, I believe in this, this makes sense, this is all coming together. At the end of following Jesus class, we became members of Crossroads. And during the new member celebration, my husband was baptized for the first time. And at that moment, standing next to him, I realized, okay, we're really doing this. Like, this, God's working. So it wasn't easy. It, it was very rocky, actually, because my husband and I were new people. And we were both taking these individual walks with, with God and, and growing. So we finally decided we were gonna go to an encounter retreat. I realized that there was just such power in being there for yourself. A switch definitely happened in me. I left there on fire for God. Um, I felt empowered, I felt encouraged. I had a new level of love for myself. 
um, a new appreciation for, for Jesus' sacrifice for me. Shortly after the encounter retreat, I started MD1, um, Making Disciples One. And um, also in that, in the time um, Weirton Campus was launching. I knew no one who was part of the launch team for Weirton. Um, and I felt very convicted though to, to be a part of it. So I was in children's ministry for a while. Kimmy asked me to, to host Kids XP and that was the launching point of me just leading and speaking, um, being in front of people completely out of my comfort zone. Through that I also realized that God had more for me. I just felt God was really calling me to something new. And so I went up to Pastor Christy one day and I was like, I don't work. <laughs> my kids are in preschool and in school and I, I'd like to help you any way I can. Slowly she started giving me more and more responsibilities. I remember the first time she asked me if I would be willing to speak on a weekend. I had been taking CTS, Crossroads Training School, and so I gave the first message um, two years ago and I felt comfortable with it. So I finished Crossroads Training School and I came on board as assistant campus pastor for Weirton, which I served for the last two years. In May, Christy called me up and, and said, um, how would you like to be campus pastor at Weirton? I'm extremely excited. I've had a heart for Weirton from the very beginning, even when I didn't understand why. I do believe that taking each step, saying yes to following Jesus, encounter, small group, MD1, eventually MD2, Crossroads Training School. Each step just led and directed me to who God had created me to be. God has just showed me that the identity I used to have was never who He created me to be. He created me for so much more. And I just had to lean in and listen and let Him direct my life. Absolutely. You never know what might happen. I happen to know that uh, a crossroader invited her husband four years before they finally first came through the door here at Crossroads. And then you never know what's going to happen. That's why we're having an invite your one week next two weeks from today, I should say, in November 2nd and 3rd. And uh, we encourage you to take that ticket and to give it to somebody that you know, because you never know what's going to happen and how their lives might change. But you do know that Jesus has compassion on those who are far from him. He calls us to have compassion, and he calls us to be the ones to help, find, help people find Jesus. So uh, here's what we can do. We're going to team together on that, on that day. You bring somebody along with you, and there will be people who are already praying that God's going to reach them. And uh, maybe you can be in your small group praying even before you invite that person for those people to be receptive. And you can have the encouragement of the team that way. And when they come, the worship team will be seeking to help people experience God's presence. I will do my very best to communicate the good news of Jesus as clearly as I can. And we'll let the Lord take it from there. And by the way, whether or not the person you invite comes, when you come on that weekend, Say hi to two or three or four people because we want everybody to know we're glad you're here. We're glad that God is drawing you here. And the truth is it's scary to walk through a church door for the first time. You know, people wonder what's going to happen. More than one person's told me, I think that the root's going to fall in, so I just want to let you know. But it never does. And the truth is, you know, that our interaction with people will have as much or greater impact as anything that day when you connect and show that you're glad you give people a handshake and a smile and give them your name make a huge difference. So let's bow together and pray. Lord God, we thank you for drawing us into your family, Lord. For all of us who are your followers today, we give you thanks that we've been invited by the team that's gone before us. Lord, if anyone here today has not yet opened their life to you, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would show, Lord, your great love for them and that Lord, they can have a shepherd. And anybody here today at this moment who would like to say yes, just saying in their own hearts and spirits, saying yes to you, Lord Jesus. I pray that your Holy Spirit would come and enter their lives in such a way that they know that they have life with you. And Lord, we pray for those who are going to be invited. We pray that you would give us the clarity and the courage, Lord, to, to take that step. And Lord, we know that you're the one who calls people. You're the one who gives them new life 
And so we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.